What a sad state of affairs. I commend your spirit, but alas, we continue to struggle. On to eternity. Hello and welcome back. Today we're going to be taking a look at a few videos that I've already covered. However, I'm going to add additional context to them and hopefully showcase that they are wrong for all their fanboys who didn't get it the first go around. I'll also be providing more context to the arcane meta or bleed meta. I ran extensive DPS numbers for most relevant arcane weapons to find what actually has the highest DPS when you're factoring in all these buffs and what offers the best DPS if you're not. Obviously, there are a lot of weapons that you can infuse to make it scale with arcane. I might have missed some. These are just the ones that I've seen talked about time and time again in my Fixing YouTube Build series. The two main videos that we're going to be looking at are the ones that I did about Cyrope's mathematically correct bleed build, which was not mathematically correct. Perhaps that's not surprising, given all his videos that I've reviewed. And then I also have the one-shot bleed build by Titrus Actual, who now goes by Emberborn for whatever reason. The reason I was prompted to do this is because his fanboys didn't get the memo that his build was quite bad. So let's try again. Today we're going to be fixing the Daywalker, or in other words, the strongest build Elden Ring has ever seen. What if I told you that strength, not dexterity, is the best stat for a bleed build? That the Godskin Peeler is not the highest damage twin blade, and that the Scavengers and Bandits curved swords are not the highest damage curved swords? As you can see here, on his build that has 62 strength, 18 dexterity, and 45 arcane, he's going to be doing roughly 1200 damage on average, with an average bleed buildup of 237. That is not enough to bypass the average resistance of enemies, meaning that on average, you're not going to be able to get a bleed proc on the first jumping attack. You're going to have to get it on the second jumping attack, which leads to lower overall DPS. With my build, with 20 strength, 20 dexterity, and 93 arcane, you're going to be doing 1,300 damage with 255 bleed buildup per jumping L1. That means you're going to have higher raw DPS, and you're going to be able to have bleed proc on average on that first jumping attack, leading to overall higher DPS. This is the build that completely shifted the meta almost a year after the game launched. When tinkering around for new ways to one-shot things in Elden Ring, I accidentally discovered that Strength and Bleed was actually better than Dexterity and Bleed. The Godskin Peeler was dethroned as the best bleed weapon in the game, and the Gargoyle's Twin Blade took over. The strongest part of this build is its diversity. You have something to target every weakness in the game, including late game bosses that are immune to bleed. So, the first problem here that I didn't really explain well in my first video is that it didn't change the meta whatsoever, because the meta was never Godskin Peelers, and it still isn't the Gargoyles Twin Blades. It's the Occult Scavengers Curve Swords, assuming you're not like level 200 or something. In addition to this, saying that a Strength Arcane or a Dexterity Arcane are the best Arcane builds is simply wrong because if you're going to be using an Occult Diffusion or on a majority of the Sombra Arcane weapons, they're going to favor more Arcane than anything, especially when it's Occult Diffused. If it's a weapon like Mirai's Executioner Sword or Morgoth's Curse Sword, they are going to prefer Dexterity or Strength over arcane but those aren't really relevant weapons anyway as you'll see with the dps comparisons later on i didn't even include morgoths because for bleed you're better off using the bloodhound's fang you have much higher damage and higher bleed although the downside is it doesn't work with an arcane build so why bleed why not a cult or heavy it's because bleed can increase your dps by a ton because every time that you proc a bleed, you take 10% of a boss's total HP, plus an additional 1 or 200 damage depending on the weapon. Let's look at a really high HP boss to showcase what I mean. When we average out the blood loss across the damage per hit, we actually see the bleed affinity doing almost 5 times the amount of damage per hit as the occult affinity. 
Even crazier is that a non-upgraded bleed affinity curve sword is doing four times the damage of a maxed out occult affinity curve sword. I didn't show this in my original video, but his testing is either extremely flawed or intentionally disingenuous. Given his video, I would have to say that it's intentionally disingenuous because, well, unless he can't do proper math, he has to skew the results. He's using the Occult Beastman's Curve Sword versus the Blood Beastman's Curve Sword. Beastman's Curve Sword does not have native bleed buildup, meaning that Occult is only going to increase AR and add a little, little bit of bleed from Seppuku. Giving the full jumping attack only 93 bleed. Now if we compare that to his Blood Beastman's Curve Swords with Seppuku, it's going to have 237 bleed buildup. He's comparing apples and oranges. If you wanted to compare an occult weapon, use Scavenger's Curve Sword. Because that has innate bleed, meaning the bleed will scale with your arcane. And then he's also factoring in that blood loss into his damage formula, which is fine. But since he's not going to proc blood loss with his occult beastman's curve sword, the test isn't really valid because you're not comparing damage, you're comparing damage and status which are two separate things, but if you combine them together, you should at least factor in the damage. Now I have an entire write down on how to calculate DPS, status into DPS, which I have linked in several Elden Ring discords. Claiming that a plus zero blood Beastman's Curve Sword is better than a plus 25 occult Beastman's Curve Swords is so hilariously wrong. It's going to have higher bleed, which because of his test utilizing Grey Roll, you are going to have a higher damage from bleed because of the insane HP Grey Roll has, which is not reflective of average damage negation or health or average resistance, meaning that it's not going to lead to accurate average damage per second numbers. In this specific instance, plus zero is better, but on average, it's going to be a lot worse. Meaning that since Blood Beastman's Curve Sword, Proc Bleed, they have, in his test, higher damage. As you can see, that is not the case in a real world scenario. This is the best Curve Sword in the game for a bleed build. There's been a lot of popularity with Curve Swords and bleed builds, specifically the Bandit's Curve Swords and the Scavenger's Curve Swords. The Beastman Curve Sword is just flat out better than both. Now the main reason for the damage being better is once again the Beastman's Curve Sword just scale better off strength than the Bandit's and Scavenger's Curve Sword scale off of dexterity. Okay, so I showed this in my last video, but I'll go over it again because I want to be very clear on this. Scavenger's Curve Sword has more damage and bleed at level 150 and below. I don't know where he got his stats from, but they're wrong. If I had to take a gander, I would say that he got 80 arcane for the scavenger's curve swords and put the rest into dexterity. That's not how occult scales. After you get the 80 arcane soft cap, you want to get 20 strength, 20 dexterity, and put the rest into arcane. Just for optimal damage, not factoring status or whatever. Although, putting more into ar arcane does affect status. Last I checked, 1300 is greater than 1200. I could be wrong, he could be living in a world where the lower number actually means that it's better. Syrobe also has this problem. He uses the Blood Scavenger's Curve Sword for whatever reason, instead of using the Occult Scavenger's Curve Sword. I don't know why, I would love to know why. Using Blood Scavenger's Curve Swords defeats the purpose of using Scavenger's Curve Swords because Occult Scavenger's Curve Swords has higher damage and bleed. Looking at a build planner will show you this is simple math that they're screwing up. If you've got any history with bleed builds in Elden Ring, then you know that the best skill that we can use on a bleed build is Seppuku. Even post nerf, Seppuku is amazing. Now this is a new one to me too, so I'm not surprised that these quote unquote build geniuses didn't notice it. Seppuku is not the best buff for bleed builds anymore. It's going to be Craigblade because it provides 15% physical damage. Now you're probably wondering, doesn't Seppuku add a lot more status? Yes, it does. Craigblade adds more damage though. The damage you gain from status on a bleed build is honestly pretty irrelevant in most cases 
since that's only going to be a small fraction of your DPS. The majority of your DPS is going to come from physical damage, which Craigblade buffs a lot more. Seppuku is a fine buff, it still provides good DPS using it. Craigblade is just better. Now a common misconception among strength build users is that a heavy giant crusher is the highest AR weapon in the game, and that's just simply not true. So I wanted to show this example of why AR isn't really that important, the actual damage is important. So up top we have a occult giant crusher with 80 strength and 80 arcane using the two hand. And we have an attack power of 1085 and a motion value of 103, which is the two hand motion value for all weapons. And we're only going to deal about 986 damage. Now, below we have the quality rusted anchor with 80 strength and 80 dexterity. And we have an AR of 852 with a motion value of 103 as we are two handing it again. Now because of counter damage, we ha are actually dealing 1110 damage. That is a 12% damage increase over the Giant Crusher with a similar amount of stats invested. When it comes to armor, there's only three things that matter. The poise, the defense, and the aesthetics. As we discussed already, the White Mask is mandatory for any bleed build and gives us our first five poise. For your armor, you're going to want to go Raptor's Black Feathers, which increases your jump attack damage by 10%. If you really want to maximize damage with the Twin Blades and Curved Swords, then you want to run this setup and almost exclusively jump attack. You're going to want the Elden Lord Bracers for 4 poise and a great poise to weight ratio. And we really have to make up some ground with the 28 poise on the Bulgo Greaves in order to hit the 51 poise breakpoints so that our attacks aren't getting interrupted all the time. And here I'm going to show the difference between optimal armor and unoptimized armor. So in my optimal armor, we have the White Mask, Raptor's Black Feathers, Tree Sentinel's Gauntlets, and Tree Sentinel's Grims. If you've watched some of my videos, this is a pretty common set for a bleed, as it gives you 51 poise, and it weighs 28.9, whereas his optimized armor, using White Mask, Raptor's Black Feathers, Elden Lord's Bracers, and Bulgo Greaves, is going to weigh 30.4. It might not be that big of a difference just looking at the two numbers, but if you're optimizing a build, that could be a difference between a point or two of endurance, which is a big deal. What's up? I'm Syrobe, and you all have been using bleed builds the wrong way. Well, he is incredibly confident for being wrong. Now, if you don't know this guy, He's the guy who does the mathematically correct builds. Explaining the example in detail, the Samurai class starts with an Uchi Katana, which has a base bleed buildup of 45. You cannot increase how much damage the bleed does, but you can increase how fast you apply it. Okay, so we're off to a good start. This is already wrong. You can increase bleed damage. You can change the infusions of some weapons and that will give it bleed one or bleed two. Bleed one will do 100. Flat damage, bleed 2 does 200. When successfully activated, the effects of bleed will deal damage based on 15% of the target's maximum HP. But not entirely true. On most bosses, the damage is not actually the same as bleed deals only around 10% HP damage instead. I did a bit of math and the HP was actually 10% damage on bosses like Margit and the Dragon Aguil. So my best hypothesis is 15% only applies to enemies that don't have a name and 10% to any bosses with a name or title. He makes a good point here, but it does depend on the boss. Some bosses will take reduced damage, and that's going to be 0.7 generally, but some bosses don't. With our first test, we have one of the most controversial weapons in all of Elden Ring. This item used to be extremely broken with the entire community at war complaining about it. Since then, it got nerfed pretty hard, so it's quiet now, but I still rate it a decent 6 out of 10. Yeah, so Rivers of Blood being nerfed pretty hard is not really accurate. It was nerfed just over 10%, and its pre-nerf damage is very good. It's not the best, it's not really close to the best, but it's still good. It's still a competitive weapon, it's just not a competitive bleed weapon. That being said, the post-nerf corpse piler is still much better than Reduvia when you're factoring in buffs. Which you should be because that is one of the best aspects of bleed builds. Most builds can benefit from having the consecutive hit 
damage buffs. What makes Bleed Build special is the Lord of Blood's Exaltation and White Mask buffs. Because otherwise, you'd just be looking at a dexterity build and stacking consecutive hit damage. When we say that bleed builds don't actually benefit the most from status, it's because status is just a auxiliary effect to boost the damage even further. The small status DPS that you get from a bleed build is really irrelevant. You just want the bleed proc so you can buff your damage because the damage is the main factor for every build. Also, fun fact about the corpse piler, it only deals physical damage. The weapon itself deals a mix of fire and physical, but there is no fire damage on the blood slash. So here we're looking at the data mined attack values for corpse piler. As you can see, everything scales off of AR, even the bullet, which isn't normally the case for most weapons. The bullet will scale off of a preset value. And so the corpse piler blood extension does have a fire motion value. And so it will do fire damage. Next up is the Reduvia. This weapon became a monster and it's the best weapon for bleed right now, but due to its short range, it's a solid eight out of 10. So let me explain. Previously, most people would power stance two Reduvias together, but stop doing this. After all the patches and updates, a single Reduvia can instantly deal over 316 points of bleed in one attack oh boy this is where things go off the rails now it's clear that he's just making stuff up he doesn't actually have the numbers to verify his data he's just using in-game testing which isn't actually accurate to finding the exact numbers so here we have the reduvia blood blade uh, bullet it has 90 blood power that's going to scale off of arcane it also has status motion value and so that's going to determine the status that the weapon does on hit the status motion value is going to be 100, it's going to be like 1. Say if something is 1.2, that's going to be 120. So since it's 100, it's going to do the full, just the full bleed value of the weapon, which is 97. And so that's going to get us to 271 for the full Ash of War. I don't know how we got over 300, because that doesn't make sense from a mathematical standpoint. I have no idea how he got here, and it's incredibly stupid that he decided to claim it like it was. But as you can see, bleed uh, for scaling for Aduvia. For the Ash of War, the bullet specifically is going to give us 174 bleed. 174 plus 97 does not equal over 300. That is incredibly stupid. I have no idea why he thought that. The reason one Reduvia is now more efficient than two is thanks to patch 1.07. Here's why. 1.07 introduced the dual status buildup nerf, which means if you do wield two weapons with the same status effect, your buildup becomes decreased to be less effective than a singular weapon. Okay, continue on with our incredibly stupid takes. I have no idea how you can, this is one hand on a run, so that's gonna be the place multiply for basically everything in the game. It's going to be 100, so that's going to do 100% of a weapon's bleed proc. Say a weapon does 100 bleed, and you have a 100 motion value, it's going to do 100 bleed to an enemy, right? So now for daggers, paired L11 and paired L12 are different. So we're going to go with the paired L11, 50 plus 50 plus 50. That's the motion value. So it's going to be 50% of 100, which is 50. And then another 50% of 100, which is also 50. That gets us 100, so that's going to be comparable to the first R1. Then it's going to be another 50 of 100, which is 50. So that's going to give us 150 total bleed, whereas an R1 would only give us 100 total bleed. So I don't know, I don't understand how he thought that power stancing a weapon will decrease the total bleed buildup compared to an R1. It doesn't make sense. You're still hitting with both weapons, so it's gonna do more bleed damage than if you hit it with an R1. This is incredibly stupid. I have no idea why I have to explain this. Let's expand on the dual bleed setups and seppuku builds now. This setup used to be one of the most OP Ashes of War in the game, but it got nerfed pretty hard and 
even then, it's still kind of useful, so I'll give it a 5.5 out of 10. Specifically, when you commit Sudoku, it used to give 84 extra buildup, which could stack on top of a weapon's innate bleed as well, like the Uchi Katana, for example. In patch 1.07, they nerfed it from 84 buildup to 30 bleed buildup, which is literally the same amount as a single blood grease, only that doesn't cost a quarter of your health bar, especially if you're using the double seppuku version, because the self-inflicted damage was increased as well. Double seppuku was also indirectly nerfed by the previous nerf that reduced the effectiveness of dual status weapons. Seppuku is now just a worse version of blood grease, but even still, it'll allow you to reach the highest possible bleed buildup on certain weapons. There's a lot to break down here. First up, I guess we should start off with the obvious. Yes, Seppuku was nerfed. As you can see here, originally the Scavenger's Curve Sword had a value of 280 bleed. Uh, now they have a value of 156, which is a significant decrease. And then he makes the bold, very bold claim that Seppuku does not scale off of a weapon's arcane scaling. And that it only adds a flat amount of bleed. Again, I have no idea how you can think this and claim to know anything about the game. Seppuku adds 30 flat bleed buildup, which scales off of arcane. So with Scavenger's Curse Sword, you're gonna get 69 additional bleed. In other words, you get 39 scaling from the Seppuku on top of the 30 that the Seppuku already adds. Like this is just incredibly stupid. I would love to take a look at his other mathematical builds cause I'm sure it's just insane, the misinformation that he's spreading. Okay. So now that we've covered most of the bad things, I mean, builds, he still hasn't shown his build yet, but we'll get to that in a bit. Reduvia versus Scavengers. Now, as I've shown, Reduvia technically does have the highest bleed per hit compared to Scavengers, if you're using the Ash of War, but that doesn't really matter. Sustained DPS is what matters in PVE, whereas damage per hit or bleed buildup per hit isn't really that important. Scavengers Curse Swords are faster and have less recovery than Reduvia. That means despite the higher bleed buildup that Reduvia has, scavengers will do more bleed up over a more consistent period of time, and they do more damage, and they benefit more from multi-hit talismans. That makes scavengers curse swords infinitely better, infinitely better than Reduvia. All right, now that that's out of the way, hopefully I proved my point. Let's get into the DPS of the arcane weapons. I'm going to start off with the Reduvia Bloodblade, Ash of War, because that is what Cyrobe claimed is the best bleed weapon. I'm going to showcase it first as a comparison as to why you should never trust him. With 10 Strength, 20 Dexterity, and 74 Arcane, optimized to a rune level 125 build, as all of these builds will be, no status, just the Ash of War, is going to do 651 damage per second. With status, you get an extra 571. That's pretty good. That's going to be one of the higher end damage per second that you can gain from status, meaning the total DPS is going to be 1,223. That's respectable, but it falls flat to even the Seppuku Scavenger's Curve Sword with the Cult. Now if we look at the Jumping L1, which is how you get the highest DPS, since you can use Raptor's Black Feathers and Claw Talisman, with no status, you're looking at 1,185 DPS, and including status, you're gonna get 1,515. Just by damage alone, you are already nearing the cap of the total DPS of Reduvia. That's not even factoring the better version of the build using Craigblade. So we'll take a look at that. <clears throat> with the Craigblade, Scavenger's Occult Curve Sword, Jumping L1, with 10 Strength, 14 Dexterity, and 80 Arcane, you're going to be looking at 1,314 physical damage per second. That's higher than the total damage per second of Reduvia. Adding status onto that, we get 187 damage per second from status, you're looking at 1,501. If you include all of the buffs that Bleed can acquire, you're looking at 6,495 damage per second. That is insane. Very few builds can rival this. If you're looking at a Dagger build, and you don't want to use Reduvia, obviously because it's kind of bad. Okay, kind of bad relatively, because I know people will call me out and saying that it's bad. The Craigblade Occult Bloodstained Dagger 
has a total DPS of 1290, which is higher than Reduvia. But since the damage from status is so low compared to the physical damage that you get, the physical damage being 997 damage per second, with buffs, you're looking at 5,080 damage per second, which is really good, especially for a weapon that seems to be very underrated if we take a look at some arcane tier lists from other YouTube creators. Now, I'm going to take apart the Gargoyle Twin Blade, which is Emberborn's crowning achievement. With Seppuku, which is what he recommends, you're looking at a pure DPS of 1,126, or when factoring status, 1,440, with buffs, 5,719, meaning that even the worst version of Occult Scavengers is going to do more DPS than that. This is with 54 Strength and 35 Arcane, which is optimized for status, by the way. So it's not like I'm pushing a bunch of Arcane or a bunch of Strength and leaving the other to rot. This is about as good as you can get the blood gargoyle's twin blade and it's lower than the scavenger's curve sword which he claims are worse not even that it's lower by 300 dps to put that in comparison that is the difference between using a venomous fang versus a short spear that's massive if we go to the beastman's blood curve sword with buffs you're going to be losing about a thousand dps now, if you're not going to factor buffs in, you're going to only be looking at a 200 DPS difference. Again, that's still pretty high. If we take a look at the Blood Broadsword with Craigblade, the Jumping L1 has a total DPS of 1,221. And just in case you think I forgot about the current Lord and Savior, according to some people, the Blood Boon Ritual, because of how long the recovery time on its Ash of War is, you're only looking at 767 DPS. With buffs, you have 4,704. That's almost on the tier of Reduvia, so that's pretty good, right? Unfortunately, it has a high strength requirement that doesn't benefit the Ash of War at all. I also took a look at the Ripple Blades, and those had actually some impressive DPS. Ripple Blade itself had the highest DPS compared to the Ripple Crescent Halberd, boasting a total DPS of 1,160 when using the Wild Strike Sash of War. But it does have good status buildup since you can buff it, meaning that the Drawstring Blood Grease will scale on your Arcane. I also took a look at Eochade's Dancing Blade just to see the prime non-bleed non Arcane weapon, and the total DPS is 620. With buffs, you can get that up to 3,000, but boy, that just... That isn't that good. <laughs> we have this overwhelming majority of people that think it's some higher calling that if you're going arcane, you absolutely must use it. Amberborn himself has said this, that one of the greatest benefits of his strength build is also being able to use EU Trade's Dancing Blade. And to that I say, why? Why settle for something worse when you can just use something better? Now, to get to the highest damage per second on this list, this is going to include a little clause, though, since Spear Talisman is very situational. But the Craigblade Cross Nada technically has the highest DPS. When you're including Spear Talisman, with no status, you're looking at 1,746 DPS on a rune level 125 build. Fracturing status, you're going to get 2,008 DPS. With buffs, that brings you to 8,645. That is by far the highest DPS that I have seen. The downside, of course, being that you need 16 Strength, 20 Dexterity, 68 Arcane for this to work, and that you need to be in New Game Plus. You can only get one Cross Nighty Nada per playthrough, like the Scavenger's Curve Sword. But if you're able to hit counter hits the entire time, it technically has the highest DPS. I personally would just use the Craigblade Scavenger's Occult Curve Sword since you're not relying on counter hits. I will leave the link to my findings in the description, but I also want to point out that DPS is just a number. It depends on what enemy you're facing 
what the health of that enemy is as well when factoring in bleed. So because of that, I went through all of that hard work and calculated the average resistance, damage negation, and health for the entirety of Elden Ring meaning that mathematically, on average, you'll be doing these DPS numbers. That's more than Emberborn and Syrope can say. That being said, taking DPS out of the equation and that somehow their statements are correct. Their builds still suck for their intended purpose. Now, if you wanted a good build guide, I have written a build guide with a group from my Discord that covers exactly what you should be putting your stats into to be optimal. On top of this, there are other build guides that are linked in it. And anyone who's putting a build on YouTube calling it mathematically correct, and who put 68 int on their Mariah's Executioner's sword build, probably shouldn't be trusted. With all that being said, calculating all these DPS numbers is a lot of work. So, if you liked the video, leave a comment, subscribe, and maybe join my Discord. Since right now, we're doing a PvP tournament for Elden Ring on PC, and the winner gets the free Elden Ring Shadow of the Earth Tree DLC. If you want to stay informed, join my Discord. There's lots of knowledgeable people there that can talk to you about Elden Ring builds, 